This is Father Gregory Pine. And this is Father Jacob Bertrand Jancic. And welcome to God's Planning. Uh, thanks to all those who support us. If you enjoy the show, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. Uh, Father Jacob Bertrand, this was our second attempt at beginning this episode on the account of the fact that I still haven't memorized the introduction, which is a source of ongoing embarrassment. So I apologize I'm to you. I'm not embarrassed. Oh, thanks. It's expected. <laughs> Um, so uh, someday I'll learn it. That day is not today. It's probably not tomorrow. Truth be told, I don't see it happening this week. Um, Listen, we, we're familiar with people from reading from like teleprompters and stuff, and everybody has trouble. So don't don't be hard on yourself, okay? Thank you. That yeah. means a lot. Um, when I worked for the Thomistic Institute, we made videos, and then you know, like the teleprompter is over the lens of the camera. And when I first watched myself do it, you know, I was like very concerned that I get it right. So I was like. <laughs> <laughs> which apparently isn't the best way to go about it because yeah. uh, people can tell but who cares about teleprompters um how is uh so you're the pastor of saint dennis in hanover new hampshire yeah parochial life hustle and flow highlights lowlights what are your thoughts dang that's a that's a heavy question <laughs> uh for a thursday um but things are good yeah parish is good we're kind of um i'm still getting used to being a pastor and what all that's like and i think at least when i was vocation director that first the when year two started it was like okay now i'm rolling so i think that'll be very similar you know take a good bit of time to like get used to it but it's good i the parish is um i think new hampshire up here we we're a bit slow they were i wasn't here for it but a bit slow coming out of covid so like when the fall early fall hit people were super pumped and excited to get like rolling again with programming and, and that sort of stuff. So there's been kind of a buzz, which has been fun, fun to be to be part of. So um, yeah, things are good. Um, my experience of New Hampshire is limited. Um, I think I would pass through New Hampshire on the way to my aunt's house because you go through like 17 miles of New Hampshire on the way to Maine. Mm. Um, and then I hiked in the White Mountains. The first time I did, I got lost and got frostbite. The second time I did, I tried to do a three-day circuit in one day, which involved me pulling off to the side of the road on a variety of occasions in the drive home for reasons undisclosed and it was just a bad experience all over and then i came up our second year in formation because father patrick invited father dominic and father bonnerich and myself to contribute to a vocation event which we thought was in hanover but it turned out that it was two and a half hours away and it involved carrying a litter with saint anne um, but Father Bonaventure and Father Dominic were on two corners. They're about the same height. Father Patrick and I were on other corners. We're a different height. So we like played seesaw on their shoulders without realizing it for like an hour and a half during a procession. Awesome. And then we came up here for recording. So I would say that that redeemed all the previous experiences, most of which were traumatic and this was less so. Good. Thanks. I'm glad that we can provide you a warm and welcomed and comfortable experience here in the upper valley yeah no it was great grace um so yeah that was great all right um in this particular episode we're going to describe or we're going to chat through um a theme which i think you know most christians pass through in the course of their lives which is to say all right the call of god his promises big ticket items we get pumped we want to convert and we want to go all in for it but then sometimes our going all in it's weird, right? It yeah. kind of goes off a little bit in one direction or it comes off sideways. So what I'm trying to say is we want to respond generously, and that's a radical call which demands a radical response. But sometimes the way that we interpret that radical response has some rough edges or has some wrinkles that need to be ironed out. So maybe set the stage. How do we think about this particular question of conversion? Yeah. Um, let's talk about me for a second. Let's do it. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my religious name is Jacob Bertrand, Jacob after St. James, a devotion to St. James, I'm the apostle, just St. James the Greater, naturally. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a few reasons to for that devotion, um, one being the first martyred apostle, his, like, uh, his position within the apostles with Peter and John experiencing sort of a next level kind of intimacy with our Lord and being privileged to be at a number of miracles and these sort of things. Um, his relationship with John that like brothers were, were called together, but also the their their title that they own earned being called the Boergenes, I think that's how you say it, the Sons of Thunder. So there's this story in the gospel that they'd gone to a town where Christ's preaching was basically rejected and and James and John were like, Let us call down thunder or like fire and brimstone on this town. And the Lord was like Easy. pepper it back boys yeah. like hold on uh and i think in many ways there's this sort of experience of the lord entering 
you know, my life, but others' lives, you mentioned conversion, like these kind of moments where the Lord enters in a new way, or we allow, we like, you know, kind of put down our guard. And there's this desire, zeal to just be like, rain down fire and brimstone on everything that we think needs to be destroyed. And um, uh, yeah, just kind of be not over excessive, over the top with things. And the Lord kind of calls and it's like, eh, let's do it my way, you know, pepper it back. There's a better way. There's a, a prudential way, a charitable way. So that, that was, that reality was very attractive for me because I experienced that in my mm -hmm. own sort of not conversion, but like deepening my faith, thinking about religious life, wanting to be a Dominican. Um, so I would imagine in different ways, people have had that kind of experience, whether it's on a college campus or going to like a big conference or a retreat that you kind of get pumped up and fired up and you go back home. And I think two things ha can happen. One is that like the, like you said, like the edges of conversion become kind of rough and it's like, yeah, like, hold on on that. Or there's this huge flare up of, of zeal and desire. And then that kind of peters out. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a, like, how do we control or manage or live well in both of those circumstances with respect to zeal to keep that kind of flame alive, but also to do so prudently? Um, yeah, yeah. And well, yeah, yeah. No, I think that starting with the witness of the apostles is an important one because in the accounts of the gospels, you just get these short exchanges where our Lord shows up on the seashore. They're mending their nets. He says, come follow me. They drop their nets. They drop what they're doing and they do. Uh, but that means for them, uh, a journey, right? It means a process of ongoing conversion. Like I think about the Gospel of John, they're called in John chapter one. And then after the miracle of the wedding feast at Cana, it says they believed in him. Well, they'd already believed in him, but now they're believing in him in a new way. And then John six with the, you know, bread of life discourse, many people leave, they're scandalized on account of the fact that this is a difficult teaching, but it says, you know, like, apart from you, we have nothing, you know, only you have the words of everlasting life to whom else would we go? So you get this sense that, all right, there's this radical conversion at the start. They drop their nets, they leave everything behind to follow him, but it still means a process. It means a journey. It means ongoing refinement of what that conversion entails. So I don't like, we don't want to say like, no, don't be radical, you know, be very cold and calculating. No, we're not saying that because we have witnesses in the church's tradition, like St. Francis of Assisi, for instance. I love this image that G.K. Chesterton uses in his book where St. Francis is tending his father's cloth stall and he's trying to finish a transaction over here and then a poor person comes over here and says, hey, do you have anything for me? And he's like, hold on one second. And then he finishes the transaction and he turns and the poor person's gone and he's just, he's struck with the recognition that he failed in that regard. And so he takes all the money from his father's stall. It's unclear whether that was stealing. We can, <laughs> we can assess that later. And then Chesterton says, and he went careening through the streets until he found the poor man, bestowed on him all the riches he had. And then he says something like, and he never ceased careening throughout the course of his entire life. And so when you think about St. Francis of Assisi in the cathedral, you know, just ridding himself of all of his father's possessions, including the very clothes on his back, or jumping into a thorn bush, or making himself the snow family, or going to the sultan so that he might convert him or be martyred, both good options, right? Like this radicality characterizes whole life. So we want to be radical, but we don't want to like give away all of our possessions and discover the next day that we need all of them back because we have a job to do or we have a vocation to live. So, yeah, maybe thinking about it in those terms, we have a little bit of the lay of the land insofar as we see how the Lord calls the Blessed Mother, the Apostles, saints throughout the ages, ourselves, right? But that we're trying to cultivate a, a balanced, virtuous life, which is radical, but which, you know, prepares us for the concrete life and mission that God has entrusted us with. So, yeah, maybe sussing out this conversation, yeah. you know, like, what would you think? The first thing that comes to mind is, like, we don't want to be defined by the honeymoon period of any experience. Um, I think of this, I'm sure, and I think of this with my in, in my own life with respect to like entering religious life. I imagine we can think of it in all sorts of terms, like you know, going away to school, starting a new job, getting married, you know, starting a life with somebody, you know, all these kind of things. But at least with respect to religious life, and you see this like every year with the novices, and it's a good thing that like men come to the novitiate and they are like super pumped, super like energized they want to do all these things and then you get to the novitiate and i think kind of the struggle of the novitiate of being formed in the novitiate is um having like my expectations actually conform to reality it's like oh this is this is what singing the choral office is like it's like it's not always great and beautiful and you really have to work hard and like kind of you know and like living with these men and it's just sort of a um a coming to terms with the reality so i think the radicality question of like how do i measure that because like you said and like what i want to say now is that we don't want to we don't want to be like stoics we want to be radicals and following christ but it's a question of radicality according to whose terms 
is it the terms that we set up as far as like this is what it means to be like a radical disciple but according to whom or is the, are these the terms that christ sets up because we can think of the story of the rich young man too this comes into mind here um you know, he, he's keeping the commandments, he's living a good life, and he asks, what else, like, what else should I do? And the Lord says, go sell what you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. And in a way, that's radical, but also, I mean, now in, like, the Christian dispensation, we have a couple thousand years to live and think and consider that reality. It's, like, to give to the poor and follow Christ, it's like, we've heard that, you know, so it's it's kind of, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an uncommon thing, but there is a radicality to it, but there's also a normalcy to it. So I think that the question of who's, whose terms are being um being pursued or like kind of like whose parameters are being pursued is is a really good question to ask and i think that comes and goes i'm not i'm not saying like stifle out the zeal stifle that out but it's always a good question to ask is like am i am i motivated by what i think is i should be doing is this sort of a front that i'm putting up or is this how like is this how the holy spirit's working in my life and sometimes the holy spirit does things like with with St. Francis, and it's like, bro, put your clothes on, you know? <laughs> uh, and sometimes the Holy Spirit, it like sometimes the radic- radicality of a Christian vocation is is looks very different. Mm-hmm. And like, praise be to God for, for each. Um, but they come from the Spirit, not from us. Yeah. Yeah, we talk a lot about the mystical body, that each of us has a place in the mystical body, and that each place is unique and unrepeatable, and it's glorious insofar as we consent to and cooperate with the graces that God has actually given. So like, you know, how St. Francis responds to the grace of God looks differently than, you know, how my father responds to the grace of God and how your sister responds to the grace of God because they occupy different states of life, you know, different times, places, settings, and circumstances. And so, you know, we place the stress on, on being faithful, on being constant, on being charitable, and the, the kind of container into which God pours his grace uh, and the shelf on which that container is placed will often dictate how the unfolding of that fidelity and constancy, in fact, looks. So I think that, um, yeah, maybe it introduces a conversation about, we, we talk often about comparison, like envy, sloth, the kind of vices that arise when we're looking away from where we ought to look, which is, say, keeping our eyes fixed on Christ and on the friends, the family, the associates who, you know, kind of like aid us in that pursuit and whom we aid by our own service of God. So, yeah, maybe your thoughts on that, just like, what, what, what are we thinking here? Yeah. Um, so I think with the saints, the saints, the saints that we know, I mean, like the saints that are on the calendar, the saints that have popular devotion and piety, these, these, yeah, these, these types of saints, we know because they magnify the glory of God. You know, they're given to us by, by God so as to, um, point out the reality of holiness, but in, in ways they're also, um, we have to sort of respect how they're given to us. Um, and I think that we look at the saints because they magnify a particular way of, of living or a particular virtue, a particular way of living like heroically in a, in a very particular circumstance. I've used the word particular a number of times, so I'll back off from that. But um, I think for a lot of us who aren't called to be such like public witnesses, because we have these public saints, right, that are known known by the church, but there are how many, many thousands of saints who are unknown, right? These these who are given to us to be emulated, I think are given to us to be emulated in, in with respect to one way of living or like a handful of ways. So like Francis and his poverty, like Francis shows us the radicality of the poverty of Christ and like love of the poor. Francis doesn't show us sort of the radicality of a life devoted to sacred truth the way that Dominic does. And that's fine, but... Um, in our lives, I think often we we have devotion to many saints because we have like those kind of charisms, those kind of qualities, those kind of gifts in uh, a lower kind of dialed down form, but in in kind of a, with greater diversity in our own lives. So of course, Francis had other uh, other kind of devotions and stuff. But like for me, I I need like as a Dominican devotion to truth, but also like as a Christian devotion to the poor, and like um, so the saints highlight for us. A particular mode of radicality that we then I think we adopt along with other modes of kind of discipleship. So I, I make mention of that because um, sometimes when we look at the saints, like Francis is like the description of Francis's life that you already painted. It's like, do I need to do all that? It's like, no, you don't. But what does Francis teach you about being a disciple? 
about you know the, the the fulfillment of like the rich young man story of giving what you have and, and following Christ and it's, okay we'll look at another saint what does like what does Saint Monica teach us about being a Christian well you know her consistent prayer for Saint Augustine her son's conversion like our our devotion to those who have yet to come to like the fullness of truth so we kind of take bits and pieces um, that then and this is the last thing and maybe you'll have something to say about that or this um, that then are kind of appropriated to our vocation. Mm -hmm. you know to like our way of living like if a father who has responsibility for a family was to give away everything that would be irresponsible mm -hmm. like he has to raise a family a mother has to raise a family you know so we we kind of have to appropriate these things in a way that's appropriate mm -hmm. to our to our state in life yeah now I, um we've talked about this before this idea that vocation is the fruit of virtue okay so like when we grow in the life of grace and virtue the desires of our heart are healed and elevated. And in the process, we come to know both God and ourselves. We come to know our identity and our mission. And like the vocation that we embrace in light of that recognition is our, you know, principal means, one of the principal means whereby we attain to salvation. But if that's true, then virtue helps us to come into the possession of our vocation. So every Christian gets every virtue insofar as he who has one has them all because they all come with charity at baptism and sometimes in anticipation of baptism. But you see in the lives of different saints, different spiritual temperaments, like certain virtues come to the fore. Like I think about uh, Saint Jean de Brébeuf as an especial example of courage, or I think about, you know, like you said, Saint Dominic is an especial example of wisdom. Um, so I think in our lives, we're kind of, we're, you know, we're seeking to follow the Lord Jesus. And in the process, we come to discover our own spiritual temperament, which is an indication of the particular type of life for which he has suited us. Like I think about my own experience, I really like these, I don't know, you read the Louis de Waal books? I have, yeah, a number of them. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, I like those a lot. So I read, you know, a handful of them. And some of them you read and you're like, cool, history, you know, like the Restless Flame about St. Augustine. I was like, I could have read the Confessions, but this was a charming way to read it. Yeah. Um, then you read the one about St. Benedict, which I think was called the Citadel of God. It's like, wow, it, but... oldie timey, cool, cool, cool. And then I read the one about uh, St. Francis of Assisi, which is called The Joyful Beggar. And I was like, you know, very inspiring madman, book back on shelf. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, it doesn't have a claim on my life in the same way. But then I read The Quiet Light the summer after my freshman year of college. And I said, I recognize in this man's life the peculiar virtues that God is, you know, stirring up in my own. Yeah. And I want to love the Lord the way that he loves the Lord. Yeah. So there's like a recognition there that wasn't present in other lives. And it wasn't because the other lives are bad. It's just that the other lives didn't speak to me in the same way because they didn't reflect the way in which the Lord was addressing me here and now in this particular life. Yeah. And that's St. Thomas, right? Yeah, yeah that's Saint, exactly. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's St. Thomas Aquinas, which is yeah. like people are like, oh, how did you, you know, come to the understanding of your vocation? I'm like, buy a, you know, a novel. A on novel. Saint Thomas. <laughs> yeah. Great. <laughs> which isn't the most, whatever, it doesn't matter, but the Lord uses the means that he uses. Um, and so I think that, yeah, there's something, there's something about that, like the recognition that I've been called to love the Lord in this way, in this time, this place, with these people. That's, that's where the radicality really takes root, you know, because there's no radicality in the abstract. There's a radicality of this life, of this life, of this life, and then, then the radica radicality that those lives, you know, kind of stir up in my yeah. own heart. Yeah, and, that, and that's, that's, um, that's the, the sort of like, uh, what living of that is also, I guess, for for a life to be radical, it has to be radicality. Like you said, doesn't exist in the abstract. It's not just a, it's not just there, and we have to go get some of it to be a good Christian. It's a comparative kind of thing. It's radical. To be radical, it needs to be compared to something. Um, so, I, yeah, th there it's kind of a comparison. Like the Christian life in itself is radical. I mean, the claims that Christ makes of himself and on us are, are radical compared to the world in which we live. They were radical in first century Israel, they're radical now, um, and and they do require, require a certain zeal and prudence to live them and to pursue them and to live with him and pursue him because of the world in which we are we're, we're mired. And we can list a whole host of things that like are contrary to Christianity to Christ to discipleship to holiness in our world and and saying like being convert you know the the process of continual reversion and backing away from those sort of things even things that might appear to be good or sort of innocuous it's like yeah that's that's strange that's radical you know the even like not eating meat on Friday like that's weird you know it's I mean it's part of our tradition and there are reason good reasons for that and you know to adopt a life of penance that that is reminding us of the of our Lord's suffering on Friday and these sort of things but like 
for other people, if, if you're around a bunch of people who weren't raised in this sort of Christian context and are out to dinner on a Friday and don't, you know, it's like that stands out. There's kind of a radicality even in the simplicity of our of our faith. So um, with that, I think there's also kind of a beauty of like, yeah, I reject a lot of the things of this world and um, I cling to something else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think maybe, you know, as we kind of round out the episode, I think it might be helpful just to highlight ways in which the Christian life is radical and then the Christian life is balanced or, you know, like moderated or however we want to say, like tempered even. Because here it's helpful, I think, to think about uh, the virtues, right? Mm-hmm. There, there are some virtues, we say virtue is in the mean, which is true, especially of like temperance or fortitude or justice. Temperance, it's very clear, right? So you don't want to overindulge in certain sensible delights, food, drink, sexual intercourse, because then you just get lost in them. But you don't want to be like wholly insensible to them because that's a deficiency of your humanity. So just as excess is a threat, so too is deficiency. Like when somebody says like, hey, I made this delicious cake for you. You're like, I, I am unmoved by tasty things. It's like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Eat the cake and enjoy it. <laughs> right? Or like yeah. fortitude is another clear one where it's like, all right, so fortitude being courage, battlefield courage. You don't want to be cowardly, right? Suffer by defect, but you also don't want to be rash because if you're constantly just throwing yourself into the the heat of battle without any clear purpose, you're going to die and you won't have actually served the purpose that whatever general or commander is trying to affect because you're dead. Um, So there's a mean and especially these virtues of the appetites. But then when we talk about the theological virtues, faith, hope, charity, there's no mean, right? The mean is just an extreme. We want to be as faithful as possible, as hopeful as possible, as charitable as possible. And we come, you know, we come into the fullness of that virtue as we tend towards this limit with the recognition that we're never going to hit the limit because there's no point beyond which we cannot grow in charity because God is infinitely generous, we're infinitely capacious, and and charity is infinite. So we seek for a kind of extreme, but not with the anxiety that like, ah, I haven't done anything until I get there. It's like, no, it's a radicality of tendency. So I don't know, maybe just thinking like, okay, virtue is in the mean, but in certain ways, instances specifically with the theological virtues virtues is in the extreme maybe how do we wend our way between balance of a certain sort or moderation of a certain sort and then this zeal or radicality on the other hand yeah i think it's it's sort of a how how is the extreme lived with those kind of um with like the theological virtues in that respect and even our living of the theological virtues is moderated or um governed in ways by the, the cardinal virtues, like you said, if you have one, you have them all. They, they work in a sort of nexus of of enabling to live, of disposing us to live in a particular way. So even with respect to like with charity, there is a way to live love in a way that's prudent. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, again, for me in, in my sort of reckoning with this, it's um, how do I live in a way that is like in accord with the gospel? Because by way of like the theological virtues to, to know love and hope in God, there, you know, we, our love is modeled on Christ, um, on Christ's total gift of self, you know, that he laid down his life and we ought to live, lay down our lives for our brethren. That's how we know what love is. That's extreme. That's radical. But there's also this this reality of like, well, how did Christ live in his humanity? You know, the man was prudent. He was the God man was prudent, virtuous, uh, prudent, temperate, all of these kind of things. So um, it's kind of a it's a balance of 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 the two, I think. But one has the lead. The theological virtues, our love for God and neighbor have have the lead. So in, in sort of examining, questioning how how we're living, how we're living zealously, radically, prudently, it's I think that there has to be a sort of hierarchy in, in that ordering of am I loving? And if I'm not or I'm not loving totally or believing totally, what what is the hindrance there? Um, and then how do I address that in ways that is also like prudent? You know, if, if it's you know, my love is lacking. So let me like run, go into a church, strip, strip off my clothes and go do something else like St. Francis did, like maybe for Francis, but like for me, I don't know if that's a prudent thing for me, you know, like, but does that mean that I cannot love in, in total ways? No, it doesn't. Yeah. Here I think of the verse in sacred scripture about, so I think it's in the gospel of Matthew and it's with reference to St. John the Baptist, where our Lord says, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force. And that's in you know, it's interpreted in a variety of ways in the Christian tradition. But the basic idea is, okay, so there's the one thing necessary, right? God. And our relationship with God is to be prized above all else. But it doesn't mean that the other things that we are to prize thereby disappear mm-hmm. or that we care 
in no way, shape, or form for those things. We care about them in God, right? So we care about them to the degree or extent that they come forth from God and return to God, and we're instrumental in that coming forth from and going back to. And so, you know, that the kingdom of heaven in the Gospel of Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is just Christ, right? It's Christ who comes in search of us to seek and to save the lost. Um, so if this is the one thing necessary and all things are to be governed and judged in light of that one thing necessary, then that can be that can be a principle or a source of a certain violence, right? Because if this secondary good has gotten in the way of the one thing necessary, then I need to, you know, cut it off and cast it forth from me, lest I be thrown bodily into Gehenna. Or if this thing is a source of distraction or dispersion or whatever it might be, that demands of me as a Christian to think like, okay, how is the Lord by his grace prompting me to address this or to confront this or to whatever it is, you know? And so like the radicality is often played out in very simple, humble ways, right? Uh, uh, maybe I should sign, I should have somebody change my Netflix password and sign out of the shared family account because I'm, I'm just spending way too much time. I'm really tired when I wake up, blah, 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 you know, whatever. Um, it, can, it can look like that, mm -hmm. but ultimately the source of the radicality is the adherence to God, which can give shape to everything else. So yeah, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think the, the sort of, um, at least like what disposition towards radicality, towards zeal, it's always, I, th I think, good to to err on the sort of side of more, not in, not in a vicious excess kind of way, but to err on the side of like committing, giving yourself more and trusting like the teachings of the church, um, Christ's teachings, um, friends, family, like the whole kind of um, the church in which we live to be a guide there to sort of say like, hey, chill, like it's a little much here, um, but to, to give uh, to Nobody grows in holiness by holding themselves back, mm -hmm. but by throwing yourself in and being formed by what you be form, being formed by Christ and by His grace and those sort of things. And sometimes that takes a little bit of time. Sometimes that takes a little bit of guidance from other people. Um, I also think it's important here in that guidance thing to like look around. Mm -hmm. Like, what are other people like people that are around you, near you, who um, you can see like, yeah, there's a pursuit here. There's a there's a chasing after Christ. What are they doing? How are they living? And how, you know, like to use examples because we have examples in the saints, but we also have examples in, in in people that we're we're with. You know, friends along the way, whether they're close friends or people in the parish or you know, other people in the church that we see. It's like yeah, there we should be inspired and moved by that too, and but also guided by that. So uh, I think we we're not. Sometimes we think, well, I don't know how to judge. Like if I'm doing this well, it's like well, you're not in it alone. Mm -hmm. Like look around, ask somebody, those sort of things, take courage in that. Yeah. yeah, take encouragement from those who have chosen to live radically, you know, like friends, family, whomever, um, and then also confirm in them that same choice as they confirm it in you because, yeah, yeah like we often say, you go to God together and it's real tough to go to God alone. Um, you don't say difficult. That's just a stupid thing that I say. But um, we have come to the end of our time together. Uh, so thanks, as always, for listening to God's Planning. Uh, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you would like the episode, subscribe on YouTube or on your podcast app and leave a five-star review. If you'd like to donate to the podcast through Patreon, you can follow the link in the show notes or description. And also in the same show notes or description, you'll find links uh, to godsplanning.org where you can have some merchandise options, should you so choose, uh, and also see details on upcoming God's planning events. So, yeah, that's it. Our prayers are for you. Please pray for us, and we'll look forward to chatting with you next time on God's planning.